Well, good morning. This week, we have something big coming up. I don't know if you're aware or not, but we have Night to Shine coming up this week, and we are so excited. Yeah, you can give it a little woo-woo. That works, you know. Um, We are so, so excited to welcome all of these guests onto our campus and to live out who Jesus called us to be, right? To, To be the hands and feet of Jesus, to serve people who are often neglected in our community. And so, Uh, I want to thank all of you who are going to serve this week, and I I just wanted to take some time together as a church to pray over this event in advance, and so would you join me in that now? God, we thank you for the opportunity to show our community who you are. We, We thank you for the opportunity to serve. We thank you for the opportunity to love some incredible guests, God, to to communicate to them how you see them that they are made in your image, that that they are your sons and your daughters. And so, Father, I I pray that as we prepare this week that you will uh, equip us to do all of these these efforts with that in mind, with, with the goal of honoring you and of making your name known and of showing your people that you love them. And so, Father, I pray that you will prepare the hearts of our guests this week as we get, welcome, get ready to welcome them. And, Father, I, I pray that you will make your love known. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in week two, like uh, Brian said earlier, of this series, Entrusted. And we're taking a look at some of the, the resources that we have been entrusted with, that the, the things we have in this world, whether those are possessions or time or energy, they're things that we've been entrusted with. They're really all God's. And so this week we are focusing in on this, right? On time. Woo! And I'm gonna take mine. Um, Hey, I think when, when we start a conversation about time, we should start out by recognizing that we regularly feel like we don't have enough of it. Like we are convinced that if somehow we could have more time, if we could do things faster, that it would totally change our lives, that that suddenly there would be this sense of of peace that would enter our homes, that that we would be calm, that, that we would spend the time that we wish we could with our loved ones, that we would learn that new hobby, that new instrument, that we would read that book, that you fill in the blank, right? That if we had a, a couple more hours a day, that that would do it. That it would satisfy our needs, that it would satisfy our desires. And yet, the famous theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, wrote this, What would it take to satisfy human desire? Everything. What would it take to satisfy human desire? Everything. And I think if we're honest, that's what we chase after sometimes. We chase after everything. We want to make sure that we see every new show that comes out on every streaming platform that any of our friends have seen so that we can be in the know. We we want to chase after making sure that we see every single post that anyone that we've ever met posts on any social media site anywhere, that we see everything. We we want to see everything to the point that that some of us are guilty of, of trying to find the bottom of Instagram reels, that we're convinced that if we scroll for long enough, we will find the end and we'll have seen everything. We we wanna work all of the hours, we wanna earn all of the money, we wanna have all of the possessions, we want everything. And there's this little thing called time that keeps getting in the way of us having everything. But if we're honest, that desire for everything, that that human desire to chase after all of it, it hasn't really worked, has it? I mean, we as a society, we as a community, we, we feel stressed, depressed, and alone. 
depending on, on which study you read, I kind of find, found kind of a middle ground. Um, somewhere between 20 and 30% of adults in America reported symptoms of depression in the year 2020. Not at some point in their lives, and not that they had a bad day, they reported ongoing symptoms of clinical depression in the year 2020. 34% of young adults, that's ages 18 to 34, say that they feel alone. And we all feel stressed sometimes, don't we? And this pursuit of more time so that we can have enough, it, it's not working. It's not leading to this, this rich and full, satisfying life that we desire. And so this week I wanted to, in the context of all of that stress, depression, and loneliness, take a look at something that Jesus shares with us in Matthew chapter 11. He says this, then Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Okay, all right, where am I going to, Jesus? Like, like let's go, that's, uh, that's me. I'm weary. Anybody else, is anybody else ever weary? Come to me and I will give you rest? Like, sign me up right now, okay? Like, I'm in, I'll show up, you give me rest. Uh, guys, you don't understand what I will do for a really good nap, okay? Like, I'm in. And Jesus offers this, and, and, and for so many of us who have been following Jesus for a while, we start to have questions, though, as we read this. Because a lot of us start to ask the question of, well, well I made a decision to follow Jesus years ago. I made the decision that I was going to follow Jesus years ago. I got baptized, I come to church, I'm in a life group, and I'm still weary. I'm still tired. I'm still chasing after you fill in the blank. Dallas Willard wrote about this passage in Matthew 11. He says this, In this truth lies the secret of the easy yoke. The secret involves living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. Our mistake, and this is crucial, guys, our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists of loving our enemies, going the second mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently and hopefully while living the rest of our lives just as everyone else around us does. It is a strategy bound to fail. He says, look, we, we want all of the peace. We want all of the patience. We want the ability to live as Jesus lived, at the pace that Jesus lived. We, we want to, to love our enemy well. We want to be willing to go the second mile. We, we want to do these things. But if we continue to operate the rest of our lives just as everyone else does, we will fail. So what does it mean to adapt the overall lifestyle of Jesus? Jesus lived a couple thousand years ago. He spoke a language that is not commonly spoken today. He wrote in a language that's not commonly written in today. So like, what does that mean? Am I supposed to learn that language and speak that way? Does this mean that like electricity is the devil? Like, like what is this? What does it mean? I think that we get an important hint at what the overall lifestyle of Jesus was like in Luke chapter five. Check out what it says there in verse 15. 
But despite Jesus' instructions, he had told people not to tell everybody about him, but, you know, they were great listeners. The report of his power spread even faster as vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Jesus lived a life where he was in extremely high demand. If you're here today and you're like, Matt, I know you're going to talk about our time. You're going to tell us to slow down. Okay, that's great. Whatever. Um, You don't understand what it's like to be in my shoes. You don't understand what it's like to to be as busy as I am, to have as many people relying on me as I do. You don't understand. And look, I may or may not have a clue what your life is like. But Jesus knew what it was like to be busy. Jesus knew what it was like to have a lot of people who who desired his time. See, Jesus walked here on earth and and taught in a way that led crowds to follow him. To literally follow him as he went from town to town. To follow him to hear some of what he had to say. Jesus started to heal people and word got out about that. And so sick people people with disease, people who were dying, people who were born blind, people who who were born lame and had no ability to walk, found a way to get to Jesus so that they could be healed. You think you have people relying on you? You think you have people who have a desire for your time? There were lines wherever Jesus went. And Jesus had a, a critical mission In in the scope of human history, Jesus spent really three years doing ministry, and he had three years to teach his disciples about the kingdom of heaven, to teach them about it in a way that they would understand our God and who he is and how he works and what he was calling them to in a way that generations had missed, that people had studied their whole lives and not understood. Jesus had a a critical mission and a limited amount of time to accomplish it while everybody wanted something from him. And yet, often, not like one time, not he just told somebody about it once, often, Jesus withdrew to pray. Often, Jesus found time and space to be with God. Often, Jesus rested. We read about Jesus taking naps. Made in the image of my God, you know, that's. But Jesus valued this time away. This time to withdraw and be with his father. And it's not a new concept. It's not something new that Jesus was introducing. It's not like the people of God had never been taught that rest was important before this. This was not the first time that this is introduced. All the way back at creation, all the way in the beginning, as God is creating something, he sets up this model for us, right? God creates everything in six days And then in Genesis 2, we read about that seventh day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. He sets aside this day and says, this one, this one, where I rested, it's holy. And it's going to be set apart. It's going to be a special day of rest. And that model has been passed down to us. The idea of a Sabbath, of of taking a day to be with our God, to worship him, And just to rest. A whole day, 24 hours every week. And I know 
that as I say that, it's like, but, but Matt, I don't have time for that. There's no way. There is no way that I could take a day every week to rest, to pray, like a full one. What about like 32 minutes once a month, right? Now we're negotiating, okay? But I'd argue with you that we do have time. Check out some of the, the stats I found this week, okay? The average American spends three and a half hours per day on social media. Three and a half hours per day on social media. The average church-going kid, ages eight to 12, will spend 24 hours a year in church. They will spend 2,190 hours that year in front of a screen. The average American male, I'm gonna pick on us a little bit specifically, guys. The average American male spends over 10,000 hours playing video games before they reach the age of 21. And so I, I know that when we think about setting aside a whole day to rest and be with God and spend time with our families and get out in nature and worship him for what he has created, we don't have time. But then we look at some of those stats and guys, there were a lot more this week that I was like, we don't have time to go through 73 stats. But as we go through some of those stats, it starts to really quickly feel awkward to claim that we don't have time to obey the pattern of rest and worship that our God established from the very beginning. It starts to feel like, like how could I objectively make that argument? But we justify it. We find a way to. I've had conversations with people suffering from addiction in my time in ministry. And not always, but the vast majority of the time, there's a common thread in those conversations. And here is the, the thing that started to stick out to me about most of those conversations, whether it's, it's alcohol or drugs. At some point, they share that they're not addicted. That the behavior that, they see, that we see in their life is not an addiction. They're not really addicted. And many times I've had those people look at me in the eye and say, I know it can be addictive. I'm not addicted. And then, usually, the response to that is, okay. Why don't you stop? Why don't you stop using? Why don't you stop drinking? Why don't you cut that out of your life? Because it's clear that there are a lot of destructive consequences attached to that. And the response is that they could. They're not addicted. They could stop whenever they wanted to. They just don't want to. And I'm gonna be a little awkward right now, okay? What if you turned this off right now? And you left it off until you got up tomorrow morning. And nobody could call you, and nobody could text you, and if somebody ate at a new restaurant, you would have no idea that that had occurred. And fantasy football's over, so like that's not even an excuse. And like, but what if you turn this off for the rest of the day? And here's the thing. Some of you, like, like I'm gonna do it right now. You should pull out your phones right now and do it with me, okay? I'm actually serious. It's off now. But some of you sat there and thought, I'm not addicted to my phone, Matt. You don't get addicted to your phone, Matt. And then when I was like, but for real, let's do it, you thought, well, I could. I just don't want to. And guys, when you hear stats like three and a half hours a day focused on social media, and then we all identify 
with a time where we're gonna talk about the fact that we don't feel like we have enough time. There's a problem there. There's a disconnect somewhere in there. And it's doing damage to our souls. It's leading us to a place where where we are tired and we are weary and we have been carrying a heavy burden and we need rest. And we're told where we can get it. We're, We're told where we can access this rest, but we're so busy that we just want to run right by it. John Orberg says this, It says, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. And guys, I don't want to be rushed like that. I don't want to settle for a mediocre version of my faith. I don't want to just skim. I want to dive into this relationship with my creator. I I want to walk alongside him. I want to find my rest in him. I I want to be with him. I want to follow this model of a Sabbath, this thing that he thought was so important that it's listed among the Ten Commandments. Have you stopped to ponder that for a second? In, in, in the Old Testament, God is, is setting up his relationship with the Israelite nation. And he's defining what their interaction is going to be like. And he sets before them, these are some things that are going to have to be true. They're going to have to be true of you. That These are some commands that I'm going to give you about how you are going to live your life. And guys, the Ten Commandments, they consist of things like don't murder people. Don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't worship other gods, don't follow other religions. I mean, they're the big ones. And also, this in Exodus 20, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day, Day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. As right alongside don't murder is the Sabbath. And if we saw someone clearly, regularly, consistently proudly breaking one of the other nine commandments, we would all agree that that's an issue. We got to fix this. There has to be a conversation that happens. This is not okay. This is not what God wants for them. This is unacceptable. And yet regularly, we all skip the Sabbath and we're comfortable with it. We're comfortable because we have bought into the lie that we just need more time. And so we can't give up that section. We can't give up a whole day to just rest and pray. But guys, I I don't want this anymore. I think there's a time where we have to recognize, hey, it's clear what we're doing isn't working. It's not working for us. We've tried to maximize every moment. We've taken every self-help time management course that exists, and yet still we are tired. We are weary. So how can we make the most of our time? We can obey the one who created it. We can practice a Sabbath. We can find rest 
in him. So what does the Sabbath look like? What do you do that day? There are some really phenomenal books that talk a lot about Sabbath. Um, a lot of what I've shared with you guys today is out of John Mark Comer's The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's really good. It is really challenging. And so I would encourage you that, that if you're looking for a book to do some deeper study on this, that that's a great resource for you to dive into. But as much as there's whole books written on it, at the end of the day, a little pun intended, the Sabbath is just a day for rest and for worship. It's a day for us to rest and to be with our God. It's a day for us to, to spend time with family. It's a day for us to share a good meal. It's a day for us to laugh with friends. It, it is a day for us to pray and not just really, really quickly before a meal, but to really spend time in prayer. It's a day for, for us to practice the very underrated spiritual discipline of a good nap. It's a day for us to rest and to worship. To rest and to worship. But I, I want to take us through a little bit of a detailed discussion to get practical with this. Um, I, I think that, that we need to create a Sabbath plan, okay? Um, and, and here's my reason for this, because I have sat through a lot of church services where I thought like, this is some good stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put this in play in my life. But then the next day I couldn't remember enough of the details and I was kind of lost and life just happened again. And I think if, if we don't take the time to make a plan, tomorrow's going to look the same as today. And next Sunday is going to look the same as this Sunday. And so I want to encourage you that, that if, if you're married, do this with your spouse today. If you're single, do this with a friend today or just do it on your own or whatever. Like, make this happen. Make a plan for your family and how you are going to practice the Sabbath. Because we need a plan. So the, the first thing we need to figure out in our plan is when, when is this going to happen? When is your Sabbath? The, biblically, it, it was Saturday was the day that their Sabbath was. Then Jesus came back on a Sunday and then he came back again on a Sunday and visited his disciples and that became the Lord's Day and we have church on Sunday now and like historically that happened. And, and here's what I think is important is Jesus at one point is with his disciples and they're walking through a field and, and the guys break off some barley to eat because they're hungry and the Pharisees are like, whoa, whoa, you broke the rules of the Sabbath. And Jesus responds to them and says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And here's what I want to caution you against as you make this plan. I think it's important to have a plan. But what we're talking about here is the principle of taking a day every week to rest and to worship. And so I want to encourage you not to get so hung up on all of the details of exactly what you decide in this plan that you become more about keeping the Sabbath than about allowing the Sabbath to fill you. To be with your God so that you can be filled. But when is the Sabbath? Um, I encourage you, for a lot of you, Sunday's a great day. You already gather with people to worship. That's fantastic. You already spend time hearing about and thinking about truths of scripture. That's fantastic. It's a great day. Saturday comes right before it. You can get some stuff done so that you're prepared for the Sabbath. For me, my Sunday starts really early. I get up hours before I normally do on Sunday. I'm exhausted by the time I get done here preaching. And so um, my Sabbath is on Mondays. That's when, when my family practices the Sabbath. And, and so this is less about it has to be this day of the week. And it's more about you figuring out when in your schedule are you going to make this work? Because it's not just going to work on its own. It's not, where, where, does, where do I already have 24 free hours? Like, no, you don't. So where are you going to make this work? The next question is this, what are you going to do? What are you going to do that day? Because if, if you just eliminate stuff, 
You're just like, well, no social media on Sabbath days and you just eliminate things and you're like, okay, it's a day to rest. You're gonna be really bored really fast. Like really quickly, you're gonna hate the Sabbath if what the Sabbath becomes for you is a day where you stare at a blank wall until it's the next day. That's not a fun day. And so what are you gonna do? Are, are, are you gonna pray at a certain time during that day? Or are you, are you gonna read something? Are, are you gonna make it a priority as a family that you guys get out and experience God's creation together? I know a lot of people that, that for their Sabbath, there's like a, a specific meal or treat or something that they have on the Sabbath to kick it off. John Mark Comer writes about like their family has ice cream for the Sabbath. Like they kick it off with ice cream because they want their kids to grow up loving the Sabbath. And so they, they kick it off with ice cream every week. What are you gonna do? What is that day gonna look like? What are some things you could do that, that would be resting and filling? How are you gonna spend time with God? What do you need to fill that day with? The last question is this. What are you not going to do? And this is the hardest one. Because we have to create space to rest and to worship. And so for me, I'll share some of mine. Mine are not crazy. but I try to not be on social media at all on my Sabbath. Um, Frees up a few hours, you know? I, I, I don't work on my Sabbath. Um, which is really hard for some of us. It's really easy to not go to work, but it can be hard to not work. And so for me, one of the things that that means is I, I don't check my email on Mondays. I don't check it for 24 hours. Because if I open that email inbox and I start scrolling through, I will be working. My brain will start going and I will remove myself from rest. And I'll be working on my Sabbath. And so don't work. And here's the thing. Sometimes there are going to be once in a blue moon kind of situations where, where something comes up, where, where you end up doing some work on your Sabbath. And, and once again, Sabbath for the man, not man for the Sabbath. And so once in a blue moon, that's going to happen, okay? That's life. But if you look back and you start to think about it and, and you worked two, three, four Sabbaths in a row, you're not taking a Sabbath, you're working. And so I wanna encourage you, don't work on your Sabbath. Don't check your email. This is also not a day to just get everything else done. That can be a temptation for us, right? Well, it's a, it's a cool day, uh, we, we set it aside, I pray for three minutes in the morning, and then I have a massive list of things that I accomplish through the rest of the day. And I clean out the garage, and I build the new this, and blah, 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 blah. It's not a day to just do other work. <laughs> God didn't create for six days and then on the seventh do different work. He rested. And so rest. And I really want to encourage you guys today have this conversation. Because we need this. We, we need to stop chasing after an extra hour or an extra two hours. We need to stop believing that the secret to accomplishing everything that we want in life is just a little bit more time. The reality is that our time is something that we have been entrusted with and that our God has told us some of how he wants us to use that time. And if we're gonna make the most of it, if we're gonna experience a rich and satisfying life, we have to be obedient to what we've been asked to do. We have to keep the Sabbath. We have to make that an incredibly important part of our lives that, that we protect. And so remember the Sabbath and keep it holy because that is where we will find our rest. Is when we go to our Savior, when we go to our Lord 
and we rest in him. Because he has promised us that as we do that, we'll become more and more like him. That the yoke is easy and the burden is light. In a minute, our worship team is gonna come out and they're gonna lead us in a song about this. And I wanna encourage you that, that as they do that, just remain seated. Don't find something else to look at. Don't find something to distract yourself. Just focus on the words that we're singing. Focus in on, on the truth of these words. Be still. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. Father, I, I, I repent of the fact that for so many years of my life, I completely ignored this. I ignored this, this gift that you've given me and how you've taught me how to manage your time. And so, Father, I, I pray for us as a church, I pray that you will help us to see the significance of this, God, that we will rest in you. That we'll stop buying a lie that with just another hour, with just another 30 minutes, we could get it done. We'll realize that that's not what we've been called to. We've not been called to chase after everything. We, we've been called to chase after you. You've invited us to find rest in our relationship with Jesus. So Father, that is what we are gonna do today. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name.